Hello. Welcome to the New Heights Show on Education. This is your host, Pamela Clark, and you're listening to Education in the News. Welcome back. We have a lot of great um, stories to share with you today and um, thought-provoking stories uh, written by Fee that I want to start off with and then lots of news happening around the world. So let's get right on into it. Let's not waste any time. First story I have for you is from Fee, um, which is fee.org, and it asks the question of compulsory schooling laws, what if we didn't have them? Now, if you've been listening to me for a while, you know I'm quite opinionated on this matter, and um, you know I'm a follower of John Taylor Gatto. There are some videos on our Learning Annex, school.newheightseducation.org, that explains, well, it's interviews of him talking about the history of compulsory schooling. He's written many books on the subject as well. So let's take a look at what Fee thinks about it, and then we'll kind of discuss it a little bit. So um, eliminating compulsory schooling laws would break the century and a half stranglehold of schooling on education. This is a, an older article, but they're recycling it, and I think it's a good time to do that. It was written by Carrie McDonald, just for your reference. And it says, we should always be leery of laws passed for our own good, quote, as if the state knows better. The history of compulsory schooling statutes is rife with uh, patern, um, paternal alism triggered by anti-immigrant sentiments in the mid 19th century and fueled by a desire to shape people into a standard mold history books detailing quote the common school movement and the push for universal compulsory schooling perpetrate the myths that americans would were illiterate prior to mass schooling that there were limited education options available and that mandating school attendance under a legal threat of force was the surest way towards equality. In truth, literacy rates were quite high, particularly in Massachusetts where the first compulsory schooling statute was passed in 1852. Historians Bowles and Gentis report that approximately three quarters of the total U.S. population includes slaves, including slaves, were illiterate. There was a panoply, or panoply of education options prior to mass compulsory schooling, including an array of public and private school options. Charity schools for the poor, robust apprenticeship models, and homeschooling, this latter approach being the preferred method of Massachusetts education reformer Horace Mann, who homeschooled his own three children while mandating common school attendance for others. Isn't that interesting? What do you think of that? The primary catalyst for compulsory schooling was a wave of massive immigration in the early to mid 1800s that make lawmakers fearful or that made them fearful. Many of these immigrants were Irish Catholics escaping the deadly potato famine, and they threatened the predominant, predominantly Anglo-Saxon Protestant social order of the time. In 1851, the editor of the Massachusetts teacher, William Swan, wrote, this is a quote, this whole paragraph, or actually two paragraphs, is a quote from him, um, in too many instances, the parents are unfit guardians of their own children. If left to their direction, the young will be brought up in idle, desolate, vagrant habits, which may make them worse members of society than their parents are. Instead of filling our public schools, they will find their way into our prisons, house of correction, and alms houses. Nothing can operate effectively or effectually here but stringent legislation, thoroughly carried out by an efficient police. The children must be gathered up and forced into school, 
and those who resist or impede this plan, whether parents or priests, must be held accountable and punished. Wow, what do you think of that? Now, of course, I've studied history quite well, um, quite lengthy. I, I have a love of history. And I know this is true. And I know that immigrants that came to America were often afraid to speak up because they wanted to earn citizenship. So this was really um, enforced, enforced onto the new American public when America was being formed um, as the United States. And um, isn't it interesting that that the ones behind it, especially Horse Man, were homes was homeschooling his own children. And that was good for him, but not for others. A lot of the same things we see today, in a way, but much worse, obviously. But this is how we kind of got into things. And this is what I was talking about with John Taylor Gatto. You should really look up those videos on our site and look up some of his books, like the Underground... It's called the Underground um, Railroad of Public Education or something like that. I might have botched the, the title of it. But it's by John Taylor Gatto. So, um, yeah, just check out his books. And I've, I think I've read every single one of them. And he has quite a few. But it's really fascinating to me. Okay, so back into the article. It says, this is the true history of compulsory schooling that rarely emerges behind the veil of social magnan magnanimity. Magnan Boy, I'm having a hard time tonight. Forgive me. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say. Magnanimity. And that isn't right either. I know I'm saying it wrong. So what would happen if these inherently flawed compulsory schooling laws were eliminated? Well, first off, power would tilt away from the state and toward the family. Without legal force compelling school attendance, parents would have the freedom and flexibility to assume full responsibility for their children's education. They would not need government permission to homeschool, as is currently required in the majority of U.S. states. Okay, I'm going to stop it right there for a moment because that is not true. Homeschoolers, especially well in Ohio, I know, you don't ask them for permission. There is nothing saying that you can't do it and you don't need permission to homeschool. You notify them that you're homeschooling and you have to send them specific information as required by each state. But I think permission is a poor word use uh, here in this article. So, and it's misleading. So I'm going to call that out right away. Um, back to the article again. Private schools would not need to submit their attendance records to the state to show compliance. Public schools could still be available to those who wanted them as they were prior to the 1852 law. But government schooling would no longer be the default education option. Because the state would no longer need to bless the creation of various private schools and ratify their curriculum and attendance protocols, an assortment of education options would emerge. Entrepreneurial educators would seize the opportunity to create new and varied products and services, and parents would be the ones responsible for determining quality and effectiveness, not the state, which less government red tape or with less government red tape, current trends in education would gain more momentum. Virtual schooling, part-time school options, hybrid homeschooling models, and an array of private schools with diverse education approaches would emerge. As more education choices sprouted, competition would lower prices, making um, access to new, these new choices more widespread. Now, I am going to remark a little bit on that because I really, th there are alternatives. There's answers. There's answers to fix what's happened in our broken educational system. And I truly believe that what we've built at New Heights Educational Group is that solution. I truly believe it after 
many years, uh, 16 years old that we are this year and 18 since I've been helping families. So with that being said, I really do believe that we are the answer to, to this, this issue of poor education in our country. Now, does that mean that these things are going to fall by the wayside and that the public schools are going to go out of business? Um, I really doubt it. Um, it might change into things like, you know, online schools more and more. It might do that, especially with an, a wave of monkeypox. Hopefully it's not going to turn into a COVID scare. Um, but I can see more of the online learning growing. Um, not just through charter schools, but through public schools, which are the same thing in a way. But I mean, when I say public schools online, I'm talking about the public school systems that are actually in the community launching their own online things. So online courses, unlike the charter schools who are their own individual schools and that take money from the the public school that's in the area where the students are learning that join them. So I can see that sort of thing happening. And I know there's a lot of people in the world that want to make education free and available to everyone. And um, there's a push for that. Now we ha do have to be careful on what the kind of things are going to be taught during that um, or if that happens. But I am very open to discussing that with somebody um, and, and talking about what that looks like. And I think New Heights is a good example of, of bringing options to people that, um, you know, different options, um, and options that are right for the families. So anyways, I want to address that a bit, but let's get back into the article. There's only a little left. It says more pathways to adulthood. Without the state mandating school attendance for most of the child, most of childhood, in some states up to 18, there would be new pathways to adulthood that wouldn't rely so heavily on state-issued high school diplomas. Innovative apprenticeship models would be created. Community colleges would cater more toward independent teenage learners, and career preparation programs would expand. As the social reformer Paul Goodman wrote in his book New reformation quote our aim should be to multiply paths the paths of growing up instead of narrowing the one existing school path a broader definition of education in his biography horse man historian jonathan meserly explains how compulsory schooling contracted a once expansive definition of education into the singular definition of schooling. Indeed, today, education is almost universally associated with schooling. Messerly writes, quote, that in, in, in enlarging the European concept of schooling, man might narrow the real parameters of education by enclosing it within four, the four walls of public school classroom. And eliminating compulsory schooling laws would break the century and a half stranglehold of schooling on education. It would help to disentangle education from schooling and reveal many other ways to educate or to be educated, such as though non-coercive, self-directed education or unschooling. Even the most adamant re education reformers often stop short of advocating for abolishing compulsory schooling statues, arguing that it wouldn't make much difference, but stripping the state of its power to define, control, and monitor something as beautifully broad as education would have a large and lasting impact on re-empowering families, encouraging educational entrepreneurship, and creating more choice and opportunity for all learners, which is perfectly, I mean, that is what New Heights Educational Group does. So, um, I like her article. I, I don't know what you think of it. I'd love to hear from you. I mean, there's some things that I obviously pointed out and dissected a bit um, that I didn't really like or feel like she completely understood, but she made a lot of good points 
lot of valid points. So, um, yeah, I'd love to hear what you think, though. You can always um, make comment after listening to these or even send us an email at newheightseducation at yahoo.com. So, um, we've got a few minutes before our first commercial break. I have some news here from Philanthropy News Digest. It says, Ahmed Yar launches $11 million competition to rethink data ec- economy. The future of data challenge in collaboration with Carrot, an online competition platform forum. Um, actually, that's spelled just like Carrot, the vegetable, C-A-R-R-O-T, if you want to look it up. And it will invite submissions from around the world to imagine a new social, ethical, an economic framework that establishes great fairness and the data value chain. So, that's kind of interesting. Um, the Bar Foundation outlines its racial wealth equity grant making. The foundation plans to invest between 15 and $20 million during 2022 in support of the cohort of allied organizations. Teagle Foundation announces $4 million in liberal arts education funds. The grants were awarded through three initiatives to a range of institutions across the country, from community colleges to research universities, as well as nonprofit educational organizations. Okay, the next bit of news I have from you is from the Department of Education here in Ohio state and local education news. It says Knox County Career Center students earned CompTIA certifications. Mount Vernon News covered this. It says 18 students from Knox County Career Center Computer Network Technology, also known as CNT program, recently earned CompTIA certifications. The CompTIA ITF exams focus on essential skills and knowledge needed to perform tasks commonly performed by advanced end users and entry level IT professionals. Skills covered include using features and functions of common operating systems and establishing network connectivity, identifying common software applications and their purpose and using security and web browsing best practices. The Lorraine Morning Journal reports that in New London, children find a bear on storybook trail behind elementary school. A group of youngsters and their trail guide encountered a bear June 18th while on a storybook trail behind New London Elementary School, located at 1 Wildcat Drive. New London police received the report about the sighting that was confirmed by the adult male with the group of children. A police report said the group was walking and reading a book along the Lynette McGowan Hisong Memorial Storybook Trail located between the school board office and entrance to the elementary school side of the campus. Oh, wow. What do you think of that? That would be a little bit shocking. Okay, just a moment, please. Next article up. This is from Philanthropy News Digest again. And then it says, Amgen, and this is A-M-G-E-N Foundation, commits $30 million to Harvard's Lab X Change. The three-year investment will support the free online science education platforms collaborations with STEM organizations worldwide and fund the development of a new and expanded content, the translation of materials into 30 languages and the launch of teachers of a teacher's network. Schwartzman Animal Medical Center receives $10 million. The joint gift from Denise and Michael Kellen and Anna Maria and Stephen Kellen Foundations will be used to support the hospital's expansion and the dedication of a fund for pet owners and financial need. Dartmouth announces no loan financial aid policy for undergraduates. Beginning the first day of the 2022 summer term, 
the college will transform to a no-loan financial aid policy for undergraduates and replace loans with expanded scholarship grants. If you would like to learn more about this option, um, let's see here what it has on its page breakdown. Um, hmm. Well, I mean, it, it, it has a whole article on this. It doesn't really say how to, um, to access this or what to do. Um, I would just look up Dartmouth online, but the article is on uh, philanthropynewsdigest.org. They do have a search feature, and you would just... Um, Type in Dartmouth announces no loan. That would probably be enough. There are some other announcements with them as well. Uh, let me see here. Dartmouth received $13.1 million for global security Arctic studies. They received $40 million for need blind international admissions. They also received $20 million for STEM initiatives. And um, I think there's some other things here as well. I'm not gonna read all of those because they all have separate links and <laughs> we may really um, be pushing from one thing to another. From It might get kind of confusing, so I'm not gonna do that. Um, stay on task here a little bit. All right, so this is from ASCD Smart Brief. Education Week says that there was a study done on looping and says that it improves outcomes for stu students. Repeat student-teacher matches called looping improve academic and behavioral outcomes for students, according to a study of a decade of data from Tennessee by the Annenberg Institute at Brown University. Researchers found that across all grade levels, looping resulted in slight increases in math and English language arts scores plus modest declines in absences and sus um, suspensions. Excuse me. And the Chattanooga Times Free Press in Tennessee reports that a summer reach program addresses liter literacy disparities. Disparities. About 5,300 K-8 students in Tennessee school district are part of the summer reach program aimed at strengthening literacy rates and curbing racial disparities, despite improvements since the beginning of the program. Now in its third year, officials say there is room for more improvement. And the 74 reports that in Mississippi, the Mississippi superintendent has steered growth in reading and math. Mississippi State Superintendent of Education Carrie Wright is retiring after nearly nine years, during which she helped drive a remarkable increase in student achievement. Officials attribute the success under Wright to an attitude of accepting harsh truths, embarrassing accountability, and, uh, making targeted changes to learn standards and adopting new approaches to reading instruction. We're well, good for them. That is pretty rare, I think, for, for a school to really look at themselves that much. Um, yeah, we'll see what kind of happens with that one. The Veronia Press in Wisconsin reports that middle schoolers design apps and Apple Challenge. Wisconsin 8th graders participated in an app development course through Apple's App Design Challenge. Interns from Apple guided students through the four-week program, which had students select an app concept and create a prototype. The New York Times, the National Public Radio, CNN, and the Wall Street Journal all reported on this article here. It says SCOTUS, Maine Tuition, and that's Maine, the state, M-A-I-N-E, tuition program can't bar religious schools. The U.S. Supreme Court has found in 6-3 to three decision 
that Maine must include religious schools and a tuition aid program for students living in rural areas without public schools. The ruling effectively voids 32 states' constitutional provisions against religious schools' receipt of taxpayer funding, whether directly or indirectly. Okay, I think it's time for that quick commercial break, and we're going to be right back. Stay tuned. Right now, right now, you might be struggling might be through struggling your classes or class. even failing them. You might be worried that you may not finish high school. There might have even been a thought that you may not be smart enough. Well, the New Heights Educational Group begs to differ. We not only think you are smart enough, but with our help, you will complete your high school diploma. The New Heights Educational Group strives to improve your academic success through its tutoring services. To learn more, please visit newheightseducation.org and contact us. New Heights Educational Group educational resources to help reach your goals. Welcome back to the New Heights Show on Education. This is your host, Pamela Clark, and you're listening to Education in the News, sharing news articles and stories and uh, just all kinds of announcements um, from around the U.S. and the world. Let's get right back into it. Uh, The Star Tribune in Casper, Wyoming, reports that a teacher apprenticeship program starts in Wyoming. Wyoming recently launched a teacher apprenticeship pilot program to help fill vacancies in teacher positions in the state. The pilot program will begin with three school districts and officials say they hope to expand it statewide. Um... National Public Radio reported on this next story, and it says, Research examines impact of remote remote learning. Research has found that students learned less in remote environments during the start of the pandemic than in person. But those discrepancies varied based on factors such as location and economic considerations. However, graduation rates were not heavily affected, notes researcher Douglas Harris of Toulon, or Tulane University, and school leaders are implementing programs and initiatives to make up for mislearning to improve education in the future. WTOP-FM in Washington, D.C. reports that Virginia County schools address students' mobile phone use. Concern over students' increased use of mobile phones at school led Herndon High School in Virginia to ban mobile phones in classrooms unless A teacher allows a brief break for use. Principal Liz Noto, or Noto, um, school board officials adopted a similar policy across Fairfax County shortly afterward with board member Elaine Tolan pointing to students' increased engagement in classroom discussions without phones. Um... KSWO-TV in Lawton, Oklahoma, reports that it can't prepare students with disabilities for work. Students with disabilities are learning skills to prepare them for life and work after graduating during building employment skills. For today, or best camp hosted by the University of Oklahoma, the camp offered third in 30 locations across the state is but one segment of a year-long program to help students enter the workforce, says the university's transition special age, Grace Murhead. A lot of repeats here. Now this is from Homeschool Legal Defense. Actually, they're running a photo. Oh, sorry, it expired. Um, okay, well, I, I just will remind everyone that um, Homeschool Legal Defense does um, supply grants open that are year round for applications for families that need help um, in getting homeschooling materials 
classes, co-ops, educational technology, and items or therapies for children with special needs. So if you're a homeschooler and you want to apply, um, you may want to do that. Okay, got another article here from Fee. This one is actually a newer article from August 11, 2022. Teachers Union uh, Politicized U.S. Schools, Not Parents. And this was from Jack Albaum. And it's fee.org again. It says, union leaders claim that extremists politicize U.S. schools. This is blatant re um, revisionism. When voters were asked by Pew Research prior to the 2020 election... What issues were most important to them? Education wasn't even among the top dozen. Isn't that terrible? But things have changed dramatically since then. Outlet, outlets re, uh, ranging from the Washington Post to ABC News have identified education as a potentially significant factor in the 2022 midterms. Additionally, after education emerged as defining a defining issue in Virginia's gubernatorial election last year, ranking as a top two or three issue, school choice became a litmus test issue for Republicans. This is quite the swing in just two years. Theoretically, education should not really be a political issue, but as we have seen, it clearly has become one. Therefore, we must ask why exactly this has happened. Well, we kind of already discussed that at the beginning of the show. This is how it is intended to be. So, and if somebody doesn't see that, it's because they have blinders on. There are many possible answers to this, this question. One of them came from Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers, the second largest teachers union in the country. In a recent tweet, she blamed, quote, extremists who are attacking teachers and focusing on culture war that is, quote, intended to undermine teaching and learning. Quote, the culture wars are intended to undermine teaches and learn, teaching and learning, Weingarten wrote. Extremists are politicizing schools and attacking teachers. Attacking teachers doesn't help kids. It undermines everything. You know, I can see how some teachers would would probably feel that way and I think there are some people that really may be doing that because they're putting blame in the wrong place because I truly don't think um, it it's I don't think it lays at the teachers feet it lays at the school's feet and the government compulsory school's feet it's a much larger scale problem than just a teacher um, I really feel like teachers are just as much of a victim of this whole thing as, as the students. And I don't envy them at all. Um, and, and some people may not really understand the history of our education system. And, and now, I mean, that's a two-edged sword in a way because there are some bad teachers. There's some teachers that are very negative and even abusive to students. I've had students come to me that have told me some really awful stories of how they were treated, not only bullied by students, but by teachers. And it's it's really, it, it's a really fine line. And if a teacher does act that way, they certainly tarnish everyone else in that, um, you know, profession. So... It's a, it's a scary thing. It's a bad thing um, for the teachers, I'm sure. And that's why a lot of them are walking away. They're just, they're just fed up. And I don't blame them at all. Um, it's a much bigger issue than with the teachers. It's, a, it's really a shame. But anyways, um, this is that woman's, you know, opinion on how she sees things. And she's able to share that. So... I'm not going to read this whole article. We are going to have it in an upcoming magazine. It's pretty lengthy, and it breaks down what this person believes. So it has, like, why education has become so politicized. We already kind of explained that a little bit, and I've directed you to other things to really learn more about it. 
And then it says the end of government's monopoly question. I really don't think it's ever going to end. Um, but somebody can prove me wrong on that. So anyways, if you want to look up the story, go to fee.org or you can always watch for our magazine to come out or even subscribe to our magazine so you can watch for these kind of stories to come out. It's just a lot to read here in one setting. All right. Um, Philanthropy News Digest reports that Harvard receives $200 million for Interdisciplinary Climate Institute. The gift from Jean and Melena, or I'm sorry, Melanie Salata will create the Salata Institute for Climate and Sustainability to bolster existing climate research and expand interdisciplinary opportunities and pathways across the university for faculty and student participation in the development of climate and environmental solutions. Bear with me a moment. Ed Surge reports that more districts adopt four-day school weeks. A growing number of school districts are adopting four-day school weeks, motivating partly by efforts to retain teachers and curb burnout. Sierra Carey, a third-grade teacher who is part of a four-day week pilot program, says she has noticed the schedule has helped with burnout and has given her time to recharge. Now, I have an opinion about this as well. No big shocker, right? Um, I was a homeschool mom for 13 years, and even homeschool curriculums are usually like spelling curriculums or reading and English, those types of subjects, or even math. Um, they're usually um, four or five day work week. So uh, I don't really agree with this that this is a good idea i mean i'm not for compulsory schools but just in general i i mean i think that since the curriculum is laid out kind of the way that it is that that it'd be beneficial um to do the five day now i am for shortening the days um uh, homeschool families only have to homeschool five hours a day or 25 hours a week and I think that the public school should be able to do the same thing um, but again that's my opinion the 19th reports that nonprofit seeks to keep black girls engaged in math black girls love math founder Ataya Harmon says her experience as a student and teacher led to a realization that supportive teachers are key to keeping girls interested in math in middle and high school. Harmon says the nonprofit organization uses a mix of activities and support to foster sustained engagement in STEM among black female students. Smart Brief on Education reports that Nerdle, N-E-R-D-L-E founder, shares classroom applications. The popularity of Nerdle, the math version of the popular Wordle, Wordle game, has transitioned to the classroom, asserts Richard Mann, Nerdle's founder. In this blog post, Mann shares how the game works, some common stumbling blocks and, cha and changes that have been made since the game's launch at Teaster's request. Ed Surge reports the schools seek evidence when considering EdTech. There are roughly 9,000 education technology products on the market, but there is often little evidence available just for schools to determine whether the products are effective. EdTech companies can earn certification under the federal Every Student Succeeds Act to demonstrate rational, but officials say relatively few do. Brandon Tun, Brandon Tun Herald in Florida says that a Florida schools, four schools to pilot brain health program. Seven schools in Florida have signed on to a brain health program aimed at development, developing brain healthy school prototypes that schools can use. Under the program, students will receive resources aimed at improving brain health 
and wellness with the goal of addressing learning readiness, social and emotional development, and engaging and engagement, stress, anxiety, and depression. Some of this is okay. Um, Pew Research Center (PW) uh, says that teen summer employment is on the rise. Some economists predict this could be a strong summer for employment among teens in 2021. A Pew Research Center analysis of data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics found teens summer employment was at 36.6 up from 30.8 the year before. Oh, sorry, just a moment, my page jumped. Oh, and then it's just a lot of repeats. Sorry, just a moment. Work Life reports that some companies are offer tutoring for to employees' children. Morgan Stanley, Visa, and Airbnb are among employees that start started offering virtual tutoring services to employees and their children during the pandemic. If companies are going to offer this, which I do think is actually a really useful benefit, it has to be in collaboration with flexible working for parents to allow them to actually spend that time with the children because there's no good because there's no good if this is in lieu of more flexible working environment advises Nikki Pritchard managing partner at Anderson Quigley an executive search company some more uh, from the Department of Education but we're going to have to take another quick commercial break, and we'll be right back. We'll get into that. Hello, Hello listeners. listeners. If you're enjoying the New Heights show on education and want to support or donate to our organization, please visit www.newheightseducation.org. And while you're there, check out our online store. Hello, welcome back to the New Heights Show on Education. You're listening to Education in the News, and I'm your host, Pamela Clark. So, this is from Ohio State and Local Education News from the Board, or, or Department of Education, excuse me. It says, um, Marion Star covered this, this story. It says, Marion City School Board approves Steve Mazzi as to serve as interim superintendent. The Marion City School Board of Education approved Steve Massey to serve as the district's interim superintendent starting August 1st at its meeting Monday. This follows the resignation of S Superintendent Dr. Ron Larusi, which is to be effective July 31st, after four years spent leading the district. As he is stepping into the interim superintendent from the Educational Service Center of Central Ohio, Board President Kelly Mackey said, and his service as interim is currently scheduled to end in December. Toledo CBS 11 reports that Heidelberg University it was awarded $1.2 million federal grant to improve college access for rural students. Medina Gazette reports that the Brunswick City Schools agreed to participate in the Ohio Facilities Assistance Program. And Cleveland.com reports that Parma's Shiloh Middle School shows off its farm to school lunches. Medina Gazette reports that Medina County Capital Investments is at an all time high in success in per apprenticeship program. Since the beginning of 2022, the $298 million has been committed to Medina County through capital investments. In addition, in addition, Medina County Economic Development Corp, MCEDC, was re has received all the funding needed to bring in career coach position 
and has since filled the role, which is not a school pers personnel role. With the creation of the career coach position, the hope is to give high school students the opportunity to talk with somebody regarding their future and what the steps are to get to that point. Okay, there's another article from fee.org. I'm not going to read it all, but it, and it kind of goes with the other articles that they've been sharing recently. This one is a repeated argue, um, article, but um, it says education is the state's greatest tool for propaganda. And that is very true. Quote, um, it's not difficult to deprive a great majority of independent thought, <laughs> right? So it's it's more of kind of the same kind of stuff we were explaining earlier. If you want to go on fee.org and look up the article, you can read all about it. But it will be part of an upcoming magazine as well, okay? It was written by Brittany Hunter, by the way. get as much news shared. We have a whole lot of news getting even backed up a bit. Um, Department of Education again. Um, New Philadelphia Times reporter Strasburg, Strasburg hires Vincent Lindsay Jr. as the new superintendent. And he was given a three-year contract effective August the 1st. Columbus Dispatch reports that we bonded over being afraid. Three Olentangy grads pushed for mandatory high school self-defense classes. Well, that's a good idea. But so is employing our nation's many unemployed veterans. But it is important to know how to protect yourself. Columbus Dispatch uh, reported that Southwestern City School District gets in line for next round of OFCC project funding, which is the um, Ohio's Facilities Construction Commission project. Heidelberg is offering a K-12 tutoring program. Tiffin Advertiser Tribune reports that Heidelberg University, along with some local school districts, will come together to offer a tutoring program for students in grades K-5. to Heidelberg will be partnering with Tiffin Schools, City Schools, Calvert Elementary Schools, and Bridges Preparatory Academy in the Endeavor. The program is meant to help students in math and reading for those whose instruction may have been disrupted in the COVID-19 pandemic or other situations in particular. Heidelberg will use grant funding from the Ohio Department of Education statewide mathematics and literacy tutoring grants to offer the program. And that's just fine and dandy, except for the fact that it's not going to really solve anything because there was a huge gap in education before the pandemic. And I just, with all those school systems involved, it, it's all, it's going to be about getting them through the day's curriculum, the day's courses, and not about filling the gaps learning and figuring out what has really went wrong because it's not all at the feet of the pandemic. I can tell you that much. Education Week reports the CDC youth ben says that youth benefits from consistent sleep schedule. More than five out of four out of five students ages five to 17 go to sleep at about the same time on weeknights. According to a CDC report that cites benefits among children and teenagers of keeping consistent sleep schedule, yet among students living in poverty, black children and those in a single parent families, researchers found that more than 25% do not have a consistent bedtime on school nights. The Arizona Republic in Phoenix reports that NFL team Stay Farm sends students to DC. Students and teachers from 46 schools in Arizona recently traveled to Washington, D.C. for the Civics Matters Arizona program. Students participating in the four-day trip 
a partnership between the Arizona Cardinals and State Farm, are attending the educational workshops and visiting sites, including the National Museum of African American History and Culture, Capitol Hill, and the Smithsonian National Museum. Education Week also reports that Amazon and Adobe leaders soft skills matter in workplace. During the recent Education Week K-12 Essentials Forum, Victor Ranoso, a global director of Amazon's philanthropic education in initiatives, and Vasali Sabahit, Sabahit, I don't know how you say it, director of Adobe Global Head of University Talent, shared the skills the students need to thrive in the workplace. They say soft skills are arguably more important than hard skills. And Renoso added that students should be equipped with analytical and com computational, I'm sorry, computational thinking skills as well as interpersonal skills. Well, yeah. uh, I want to remind everybody we do have a soft skills radio show here on the New Heights Show on Education. You can always look that up on radio.newheightseducation.org. And that was shared um, with us by Victoria Lowry, a past host of ours. The New York Times, the Associated Press, and The Hill reports that a deal has reached to forgive $6 billion in student loan debt. The Biden administration has agreed to forgive $6 billion in federal student loan debt held by about 200,000 people who attended one of more than 150 schools that the U.S. Department of Education says engaged in substantial misconduct. <laughs> so funny. I'm sorry. Did I laugh at that? And institutional misconduct. Oh, boy. Did I? Uh, I just want to laugh at that one, too. The agreement, subject to approval by a federal judge in July, comes as part of the legal action by students who attended the schools, most of them for profit colleges and career training programs. Hmm. Substantial misconduct. The entire compulsory school system would fit into that. So, wow. Are all of the parents since the 1850s going to get a refund and all the money they poured into the public schools? That would be where my mind goes, clearly, with all of this. Wow. Okay. Anyways, moving on. <laughs> okay. Bring up the next story here. The Associated Press and Higher Ed Dive reports that Education Department proposes an overhaul of the title IX, or uh, nine, Title IX, on Thursday, 50th anniversary, Title IX, uh, Women's Rights Law. U.S. Education Secretary Miguel Cardona announces a regulatory proposal that largely unravels provisions built in place under the prov previous administration. The proposals include strengthened protections for LGBTQ students and new rules regarding claims of sexual violence on campus, college campuses. I, I am all for um, protecting students, all students, um, but I also, I don't agree with the philosophy that any students, especially elementary, um, well, any students really, I mean, I think it's the parents' responsibility to discuss sex with their children when they think it's the right time to discuss that as part of maybe a health class if they homeschool and they're an older teen um, or, or whenever they decide it's the right time. I, I really don't think those, those sorts of things should be in public school in any way. So that's my opinion. All right, let me check our time. Time is almost up. So I guess we're going to have to stop here today. I did want to share 
with you that um, we are running a fundraiser for the New Heights Educational Group. If you support what we do and you truly believe that everyone deserves a fair and equal education, for, um, if they're willing to work for it, um, you can learn all about us at newheightseducation.org and we ask that you donate to our cause. It's very important because we are 501c3 ran by all volunteers 73 volunteers from all over the world and it's just um we need funds to continue so if you can help us with that we would greatly appreciate it and help us move into the future more and uh, get our dream of someday having a separate building for our resource and literacy center with a sensory room and daycare for young mothers and father living in our area and of course the tutoring center which is global where everybody can come to us for tutoring or online pre-recorded classes and earn certificates or even just volunteer with us um, but we foresee a, a large literacy center that would serve not only Ohio and the U.S. but the world but of course local students as well so if, if you support education and, and what we talk about here on the show, then please consider donating. And as a reminder, my show airs every Wednesday by 5, or I'm sorry, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we're on 27 networks, so all of your favorite networks, wherever you like to listen, or you can just go, go to our radio page. Um, and then Barbara Boland, she has our civil... Uh, right show that she airs every Sunday by 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's also pre-recorded. So until next time. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Don't forget to rate us and follow us on your podcast player. Check out our show page, radio.newheightseducation.org, for monthly announcements and other happenings.